Hello and welcome to So You Want to Start a Business, a podcast where we interview business owners, entrepreneurs and other smart guests to learn insights and lessons from those who have already walked that startup path. I am your host, Ingrid Thompson, and it is my absolute pleasure to bring you these interviews. And I thank you for taking time in your day to spend time with us. As always, this show is brought to you by my book, which has the same name, So You Want to Start a Business. And you can grab an excerpt over at thestartupsteps.com or head straight to Amazon where they have the book and Kindle. You may even find it in your local bookshop. The audio version is on its way very soon. Are you ready to meet today's guest? You know, I meet a lot of people who are extremely competent practitioners uh, with a fantastic skill set but have got no idea how to get their idea to the market. You know, so what I say is, uh, sorry, I've gone way off your question. No, but no, it's perfect. Is, is if, if someone's got an idea for a business, then and I'll say, okay, tell me what it is, and usually I'll get an awful lot of very passionate response of all the things, and I'll say, okay, so what is it you're not so good at? What do you need to improve in? And that's where often people go a bit quiet. That's the voice of Robert Gerrish. And as you can hear, he has some pretty solid experience when it comes to working with people getting started in business. Robert and I have known each other for many years and he has worked with and helped hundreds, if not thousands of solo businesses. This is another terrific interview in our series and I encourage you to listen out for the pearls of wisdom from Robert. You may even wanna make some notes. Are you ready? Let's go. Let's take the next step to help you make your dream business a reality. Hello, and here we are today with Robert Gerrish. Hello, Robert. Hello, Ingrid. Thank you very much for inviting me in. Thank you so much for coming in. And we're going to talk to Robert today about his fantastic business, Flying Solo, which Robert recently sold. So we're having a business discussion from the perspective of somebody who's sold. But we're going to do the same questions we always do. So Hmm. what was Flying Solo? What was that business? Well, what it was is still what it is happily, which is uh, an online community for people that are going it alone in business. Mm -hmm. And when did you start that business? Uh, Well, it started in its uh, current manifestation in 2005. I actually started the and registered the name about five years prior but 2005 is when it when it got all grown up that's a long time ago isn't yeah it? and why did you start that business then well um i was at that time um when i first registered the name in 2000 i had just started my own business on my own very much a lifestyle business that is a business that was designed to absolutely suit the way that i wanted to live Uh, with my wife and with our young son and as I was sort of planning that business and getting into the whole sort of space and mindset of starting up I realized that there was very little out there that was specifically for people that were running very very small businesses and being um, having a sort of background in marketing I kind of spotted a niche very clearly and I thought, hello, you know, nobody's really supporting this group. Um, I could do that. And I was having such fun building my own small business that um, I gradually sort of built a, a team around me and we, we did that to help a lot of other people. And very successfully too. Well, it went, look, it was, a, it was, it depends how you measure success, but I would say, yes, it was successful. The greatest success in my book is the fact that we, enjoyed ourselves so much for a dozen years and we you know we touched a lot of people without mm. sounding too weird mm, without sounding too <laughs> yeah. weird yeah yeah and and created lots of different ways to touch people too well, yeah look it's a you know it's a very it turned the community really was ended up kind of surviving as a um, or flourishing as a as a as a publishing business model and that's not without its challenges in the in the marketplace, but you know it was a it was a huge lot of fun. Mm, it was for the whole team and for all of us that were members. Yeah. So it sounds like you had a really strong desire of what that business was going to give you from the beginning. Um, what what was the purpose? Like, what did you want from flying solo from the beginning? Hmm. Okay. Well, uh, what I wanted was to be able to work where I wanted, when I wanted, with who I wanted. Mm. Um, I wanted to do work that was meaningful, that um, impacted a lot of people. I wanted to create something um, that would leave a bit of a legacy, something that I'd be proud of, uh, and I wanted to keep some food on the table. So <laughs> it's kind of a mixture of that lot. 
And when did flying solo feel like it was a business? When did it actually feel like it was a real business? Hmm, that's interesting. Um, when did it? Well, uh, I'm not sure that it ever did, to be honest. <laughs> that's probably not what you want to hear. But, um, you know, such was the way that, you know, and I, I should say really quickly that I, this is not something I did by myself. You know, I, I might have started it, but I very quickly had the good sense to um, enroll the, the support of a couple of business partners. And together, we designed something um, that was exactly the way the three of us wanted it. So because of that, um, we, kept lots, we kept ourselves in check and we always made sure that, you know, were we doing what we wanted to be doing? Were we working how we wanted to be working? Were we impacting people the way we wanted? Were we keeping enough food on the table? And because we had that kind of uppermost in our mind at all times, it never felt like a business. We still, you know, we still mm -hmm. used to giggle at, at sort of board meetings and thinking, you know, is this really a board meeting? Is, you know, when you, if you sit cross-legged on the floor eating an Indian takeaway, is that really, does that constitute a board meeting? You know, so, so we managed to keep the fun all the way through. That's such a terrific answer. And that's actually one of my favorite questions is that sort of what is the point of something mm. feeling like mm. it was in, it was a real business. Mm. So it's a terrific answer. Thank you. Good, thank you. So when you were setting up Flying Solo mm. and you've alluded to the answer to this and maybe just put a little sentence or two around this, yeah. is how did you know that people wanted it? Well, um, I guess the first way we knew was that, um, that you know, I was, I was doing it myself, so I was starting my own business and I realised this was, you know, very early days of the internet and I realised there wasn't much around mm. um, in terms of support. And then th things started happening, you know, I got a, a knock on the door from ABC Four Corners who were doing a documentary about new work practices and they'd somehow heard about, um, you know, what we were up to and, got, and were interested. Um, the Telegraph approached me to write a column. Uh, Alan and Unwin approached me to write a book. So, you know, there were kind of signals around the place that, mm -hmm. hello, we're onto something here. Mm -hmm. And again, very early days of, of uh, the sort of commercial use of email as well. And, you know, just all the signs were, you know, we are, we're really kind of onto something. But when we started it, you know, bear in mind the three of us, Sam, Samantha, Peter and myself, um, we all had our own little businesses alongside it. So we were doing it not as a hobby, but we were doing it without it having to perform in terms of revenue because we all had other sources of, of mm -hmm. income in our, you know, we had little mm -hmm. portfolio businesses, if you like. I was working as a coach and a consultant. Peter was a commercial writer. Uh, Sam is a writer and has some, um, and, and well, had and has countless children. So, you know, she, <laughs> she was busy. Um, yeah, so it, it was... We, it just it just kind of stuck, got going without us realizing yeah. it. And of course, because you've got such a strong marketing background, you were able to see the signals that there were people wanting what flying solo was able to offer. Yes, I think so. And you know, I would certainly say, you know, if, if I if I think of you and I think of me, I think of you as being someone who's uh, not only good at marketing, but you understand the figures side of things really clearly. I'm more marketing, and I'm not so crash hot on the figures. Um, <laughs> But that's, again, why luckily I had the good sense to surround myself with, with people better than I. Um, but, yeah, so I was definitely looking at it from a marketing point of view. And I still honestly believe that if you kind of get the marketing right, then to some extent, you know, the money should look after itself. If yeah. there's enough people knocking on your door, it doesn't take long before you work out how to ease some money out of ease their pockets. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrific. So that said about money, yeah. where did the money come from for it? Because you had to create mm -hmm. a website. Yeah. You, what, how, did the, how was it funded in the early days? Well, it was definitely the, the one word answer is it was very much bootstrapping. You know, yes. we did it with our own money. But um, so I, I, um, I invited firstly Sam to join me. And by then I'd sort of got things going a little bit. So I said, hey, would you like to come and play? If so you know, it'll cost you X dollars to come and join me. So that was went straight into business development. Um, and then the same with Peter a couple of years later. By then we'd build things a bit bigger and we said, look, would you like to come and play with us? If so, you need to cough up this much. Um, and so, you know, happily they both willingly did that and, um, and we put anything that we got straight into the business. And in the early days, um, well, in fact, a long way through the business, everything we made, we put straight back into business mm -hmm. development. Um, 
so yeah, that's how we did it. So it was all done, you know, quite quite tightly. But also, when I started the business, I was in my sort of late forties, so I'd had a career, you know, with a proper job and all that stuff. So I sort of amassed something, not very much, but enough that. Um, you know, Jane and Jay, my newborn son, could you know could survive. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we just we kept it very lean. I worked mm -hmm. for the first few years from a, a little shed in the garden, um, and you know, I never got much beyond that to be honest. Mm -hmm. But it was that's how and I wanted to work. And didn't need much more than that. No, we didn't. You know, no. it was, we were all working remotely. Sam's up in uh, Mullumbimby. Peter lives, um, you know, a good sort of forty-five minutes north of the city. Uh, we did latterly get more grown up and had an office and all those things, but um, it was a business that we could run remotely, and again, that's what we designed. You know. Yeah, that's terrific. So people came to Flying Solo. Um, how did so? If we think of the members as yep. the customers, the clients, hmm. how did they? How did you attract them? How did you know where they were? How did hmm. you run and get them? Okay, well, it's a good question. I guess we attract them through a few means. Uh, Certainly, writing. You know, I was I personally was doing a lot of writing then in the say in the Telegraph. I was also doing a lot of presenting, um, so out at small business events. So I was basically, you know, kind of tarting myself anywhere. And I love talking and presenting and writing. So it was it was very easy for me. Um, we had then had the book from Alan and Unwin in two thousand and five, and that also got us quite a bit of airplay. And delightfully, I would say the majority in those early days was word of mouth, and it probably still is. You know, people, even in this day and age when everybody talks about social media being the most important thing, you know, the truth is, if something's good, people talk about it. Mm. And that's just, that's how, that's how it happened. And, you know, we had the name Flying Solo, it's quite a nice name, though I say it myself. And it's an easy name to talk about, mm. you know, the concept's very easy to talk about. And um, and we would just at the end of everything we do, we'd say, hey, if you know anybody else that's going it alone, nudge them over there. So mm -hmm. you know, we we I think they're up to 130,000 odd members now, Australian, and 35,000 on um, newsletter and Facebook and Twitter and stuff. So you know, it's it's good. It's pretty substantial, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. So eventually, you needed to make some money, and mm. you developed a pricing strategy. How did you mm. go about thinking? And does, we don't need to know the details of the oh, actual okay. dollars, but that's lucky because you know, I wouldn't remember it. <laughs> yeah, well, you did say the numbers. Yeah, were numbers your isn't thing. Me. Um, but how did you go about thinking about a pricing strategy to actually generate income? Okay. Well, interestingly, you know, ninety-nine percent of our revenue uh, came from and continues to come from advertisers and sponsors. So. I like to think of it as the Robin Hood business model, where we sort of steal from the rich and give to the poor. So um, basically what happened was that as our reach grew, um, what started to happen was were the big end of town were knocking on our door saying, hey, how can we get in front of your audience? Um, and uh, you know, the first time people said that, we'd say, well, that's a great question. We're not, we haven't really thought about that. So then we went out and spoke to some online ad agencies, which are again, we're only really just getting started mm. at that time. We're very lucky that we we um, ended up working with a really good agency and have done ever since. Uh, we've moved agency a couple of times, but um, they're now represented by you know one of the foremost digital agencies in Australia. And they kind of advise us. They say, hey, this is the rate. Um, so that's kind of how it works. So we do, there is a, um, an element of the revenue also comes from premium membership. Um, but that's frankly always been a fairly small amount and our goal was never really to charge the audience too much. The idea is, you know, they they pay us by their attention with their attention, you know, and our model was always that we'll let the big end of town fund our, our plaything. You know? That's nice. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a nice idea. And I'm, I know the people listening um, to this podcast mm. and people thinking about starting a business or in the early stages, yeah. so it'd be really interesting to think how that could actually apply to other businesses. How could they actually get that sort yeah. of funding well, look, from the big end of town? Yeah, yeah, I think the key thing with all of it is, um, and again, the way we started was very much let you know we we think we're onto something. We we knew we had um, some traction, and we just kind of figured in our slightly hippie way that if we had enough people, we'd find a revenue model somewhere. Mm -hmm. And look, you know that's that's hardly news these days. Just about every new 
this kind of online businesses or you know the big ones are all they're they're, they're funded but they're not getting any money in and for mm-hmm. usually quite a long time so you know we kind of did that somewhat accidentally but I think the key thing um, you know and the key reason that's that um, still I believe that businesses fail is because there's no market for what they do mm-hmm. so we didn't have that problem we knew yeah. people wanted what we had and the, the money did kind of catch up yeah. and uh, that I think what worries me more is when I see people with pricing on their website and all these kind of things and I think yeah but actually is that, you know, am I the first person to ever see that you know if, if there's nobody looking at what you're doing if, if you're not getting some traction then you know pricing becomes fairly meaningless <laughs> yes, unfortunately. Indeed. Now my next question usually is about an exit strategy. Mm. Now recently you guys did exit yes. so do you want to just talk us through what actually happened because I know a lot of people um, aspire to grow a business and then sell it yeah so you know like how did that happen mm. how long did it take what actually what was the process of yeah, selling? Okay. well gosh I got to tell you it was a fabulous process um, it which surprised me um, I really enjoyed every minute of the of the sales process and that's not because you know we sold for squillions and I'll never have to work another day in my life. It's nothing like that, um, sadly. Bye-bye. But yeah, damn. <laughs> but um, the actual path to sell was fantastic, and it started a number of years ago. You know, we we realised that um, that we, we we were not going to do this business for ever so we started to think about okay what might an exit look like and what do we need to put in place so we started probably five or six years ago to just redesign things that we did so we made sure that the three of us Sam, Peter and myself were not sort of all over the front page all the time because you know people tend not to buy a business uh, or we you know we didn't want to be locked in permanently to any kind of sale so we sort of withdrew intentionally a little bit from the from the front and brought in a lot more people to write and contribute with us um so that we you know we did some things like that we also made sure we had all our ducks lined up you know we had all our paperwork in order and um all, all the documentation side of our procedures and policies and all those things that sound boring but gosh they are so liberating you know it's so wonderful when you've actually can see your business in a you know in a ring binder it's <laughs> it makes you realize that you've actually got something that people can sell so then basically what we did i've just i'm in my early 60s and so a couple of years ago i i sort of suggested to sam and peter hey let's you know let's do this let's go out and talk to some people so that's what we did and um, by then you know we had a pretty good following we got good relationships with state and federal government and most of the small business um, bodies, associations, and so on. So, you know, we've got a good reputation in the marketplace. We had nice blue chip clients. So it was a good story. Mm. And we just went around very honestly um, speaking to people. And I said, hey, I'm in my 60s. Um, Kind of, you know, we're not sure what our next stage of development is, but we think you might, you guys might be better placed to do it than we are. That was the conversation. That was the truth, because publishing, online publishing is a tricky business. Mm. And... Mm. Unless you're um, constantly moving and developing and growing, it's very difficult. You know, most online publishers don't work. Um, so anyway, we're very fortunate that we um, met uh, David Kosh and the people at Pinstripe, and um, they were really pleased to become involved with us. And uh, it's been terrific. You know, Peter's got a great job with them. Sam and myself have have pulled right back, which is what we wanted, and it's it's great. Mm, it's lovely to hear of an exit takeover mm. sale that's gone so smoothly and that yeah. it all the parties. I find it massively exciting. I mean, I, I think I must be missing something because <laughs> everyone tells me it's ghastly, but I thought it was terrific. Yeah. I loved every part. You know, people, I guess if you're sitting there with a business where you know there are absolutely no skeletons in any wardrobe, in any yeah. cupboards, yeah. you know, which frankly, that was the business we built. We Everything was, was there. Um, so there was nothing to hide. There was no conversation I was ever worried about. Uh, it was it was terrific, and we met lovely people, and they liked what we did. And you yeah. know, 
And I think when we think about a business, um, that due diligence process of making sure that the processes and the procedures are there, and, you know, I can hear some of the listeners eye rolling at the very thought of having mm. to do policies and procedures, yeah. but that's what you sell. You oh. sell all of those systems that support what actually happens. Yes. So. But the thing as well, I think, you know, we started our policies and procedures from the, from the day we started, mm. and it, it's not rocket science. I mean, literally, we just opened uh, Google Doc, and every time we did something new, we just dumped in the sort of the steps you know just little bullet points it was scruffy but it was all there Mm. Um, and then when we got into the due diligence process it was it was actually again it was it was oddly exciting to pull it all together and the thing with a lot of you know potentially your listeners people in very small businesses we often don't think we need policies and procedures but it just makes life so easy. I remember yeah. when I was running my coaching business, you know, one of the first procedures I wrote down was what to do when somebody called me out of the blue. <laughs> because often what would happen is I'd be sitting there writing something or playing with my young son, the phone would ring and it would be a potential new business lead and suddenly you've got to get away from Bob the Builder and into, you know, client intake. So, well, I had a procedure on my desktop yeah. and it just absolutely got me in the zone straight away so there might have been screaming and howling in the background but I could still speak coherently Mm. and that's what procedures do they give you freedom it's Mm. you know it also gives the freedom to hand it over to someone else yeah of course at any point in time at any point for a holiday anything anything yeah so Robert just thinking back and we know that we're going to talk about it in a moment we know you've gone into a new venture because mm-hmm. um, when I heard that uh, Flying Solar had been sold, I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder what Robert's doing now. I can't mm. imagine him lying on the beach right. just gazing out at the waves. I'm sure he's got some new venture and we will talk about that in a moment. Sure. But if you think back to the beginning of, you know, like your business, the, the Flying Solo, is there anything you wish you'd done differently at the beginning? Well, no, you know, I was thinking about that as I was coming here to talk with you because I, I knew you were probably going to ask me that question and I can't think of anything Mm. to be quite honest I mean there are uh, I that's possibly part of just who I am I don't uh, I don't often look back and think how could I've done that better Mm. Um, there is we made lots of mistakes um, plenty of mistakes we but through those mistakes you know we grew so Mm. I can't I can honestly I cannot put my finger on any one thing we did and I think I shouldn't have done that Mm. really you know all I remember is like maybe something I did two weeks ago that was stupid but I can't I can't think what that is now (laughs) do you know what I mean I don't yes you know that's not how you operate now slightly different question you may or may not have an answer to this one is was there anything you wish you'd known from the start because that's a slightly different Mm. question and and, Um, and you know, well, I don't. Again, sorry to be difficult, but no, it's um, not at all. there are some things that I suppose I could say I wish I'd known. Like I wish I'd known how difficult running a publishing business was. But then I don't wish I'd known that because yeah. if I had, I wouldn't have done it. You, you know. So it. yeah, again, yeah, no, that's good. Not that's really. Good. Well, I, mean, I look. I wish I'd known how the world was going to develop. That would have been nice, yeah. you know. Wish I'd had a little insight into the arrival of Facebook and Google, you know. That would have been useful. Um, to, but uh, yeah, no. Yeah. Again, no, that's sorry. all good. So you've talked about Peter and Sam. Yeah. Because um, my next question is about who has been of greatest assistance. Yeah. Is there anybody apart from them um, oh, in gosh. terms of the business? And you've mentioned the big end of town and yeah. the government and lots of partners. Mm. Um, Oh, sort of look, to that, be yeah, well, I have to be honest. I mean, look, Peter and Sam. I mean, just the mm. most gorgeous people to spend a day um, or twelve years with, for that matter. But um, I would say, without sounding too pithy, that the, the the people that have been the most support to us were the community that we surrounded ourselves with, because you know I always used to carry with me this sort of little sentence in my mind, which is the community has the answer. And I totally believe that. Um, and if ever we were in doubt, we'd ask them, or if, or we'd look closely at what they were already showing us. So it's the small business community of Australia in this instance, they were the most helpful people because they showed us, they told us. And um, everything that we needed to bring, you know, to bring to the fore, uh, was in response to what they told us and showed us. So, you know, we had online discussion forums, we ran a big research uh, exercise every couple of years. So we asked them, they told us. They're so wonderful at sharing 
all their innermost most feelings. Mm. Mm. And that's so true of every business, really, isn't totally. it? Totally. Is it Ask the clients, your customers. the customers, yeah. they're the ones, indeed. I'm afraid so. And my next question is mm. about feedback. Um, yeah. Does the same apply to that? Like, who gives really good feedback? Mm. Well, again, yeah, I would say it's the, mm. co- the community mm-hmm. does. Um, and, you know, you the thing, particularly if you open an online discussion forum, I mean, boy, you get feedback. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's not all always lovely um, but it's always what that person is feeling at that time Mm. Um, so yeah we had we never had any doubt uh, at any point as to uh, whether anything we did was um, being being accepted or not because you know we saw it online every day so and we asked people we made it very easy for people to talk with us um, and you know indeed they still do if anybody posts any you know put something on a contact form on Flying Solo, I, I guarantee you'll get a response a lot quicker than you expect. Um, and that's, we've always been like that, you know, that's... Mm, that's terrific. Mm. So my last question yeah. regarding this, and then we'll talk a little bit about sure. what you're going to do next. Mm. Um, so for you personally, and this kind of segues into the next question about what happens next for Robert Gerrish, is that what are the three characteristics that you think make you successful oh, in business? Golly. Um, uh, what are the three characteristics? Um, well, I think I'm pretty good at always having a uh, future picture. Mm-hmm. And so I guess there's a little bit of creativity wound in there somewhere. But I kind of always know where I'm going. Mm-hmm. Um, even if I don't know, even if, even if the path is not very long. You know, it's not very far into the distance. I've always kind of know what, where I'm heading mm-hmm. broadly. So I think having a, a good sense of, of, of kind of the direction. Uh, I would say always having um, a good understanding of the purpose. You know, why are we doing this? Mm-hmm. Why am I doing this? Mm-hmm. Why am I getting up every morning? <laughs> you know, I've got a, got a good sense of purpose. Um, and I think probably... Finally, I just say uh, enjoyment. You know, if if um, if I'm not enjoying it, and if the people around me aren't enjoying it, what the hell are we doing it for? Mm. So, yeah, you know, I have to listen back to these responses because <laughs> they're, right. they're not planned. Um, but yeah, I'd say those. That's good. So, if someone comes to you and says, "I'm thinking about starting a business," yeah. what do you say to them? Great, well done. And um, what sort of business are you thinking of starting, and who are you going to serve? And tell me more. I'll just get people talking mm-hmm. and if, if somebody you know the hardest question to answer if somebody says I really want to start a business but I've got no idea what to do uh, that's a tricky one um, but most times that's not the case most most people have got an idea what they haven't necessarily done is is kind of harnessed it in any sense of reality mm-hmm. um, and that sounds a bit mean but um, it's you know I, I think uh, a, a, a kind of situation that I often describe is there's a lot of people who are very skilled at doing certain th- things. They have talents, but their talent may not be actually designing and starting and growing and building a business. You know, I meet a lot of people who are extremely competent practitioners uh, with a fantastic skill set, but have got no idea how to get their idea to the market. Mm-hmm. You know, so what I say is, uh, sorry, I've gone way off your question. No, but no, it's perfect. Is, is, if, if someone's got an idea for a business then and I'll say okay tell me what it is and usually I'll get an awful lot of very passionate response of all the things and I'll say okay so what is it you're not so good at what do you need to improve in and that's where often people go a bit quiet mm. um, and that's where they need to concentrate their time you know because when you think you're starting a business usually everyone around you says it's a great idea particularly friends and family they're not to be trusted by the way um, they all tell you it's a great idea um, and then you talk a little bit wider and people tell you yeah, it's a great idea and then often people get started on that basis uh, without really researching and talking to enough people so that's the kind of thing I, I say to people is how many people have you talked to what proof have you got that anybody wants what you've got yeah, that's it. the yeah. proof that anybody wants what you've got yeah, yeah. yeah. so speaking of anybody yeah. wanting what you've got yes. What have you got for us? Well, yeah, so tell us about your well, new venture. Not a lot to say at this stage. I mean, basically what I'm doing, so I still do, uh, happily I do some work with Flying Solo. I still present their podcasts and I write a bit for them. And what I'm tending to do now is I'm concentrating more on a new niece, which is the older entrepreneur, because, well, I am one. 
Uh, and again, when I've had a little look around, I realize, oh, ah, okay, so there's an awful lot. In fact, the, the largest growth sector of uh, startup businesses are people over 50. Mm. Didn't know that until I looked. Mm. Uh, so my, um, my business now is, is to support those individuals. So I'm not mm. looking to create another whole big publishing business. Um, but what I will be doing is uh, working one-on-one -on -one with people or running little workshops. I've got a new book coming out in a couple of weeks, a couple of months. Um, and I ha have a new podcast called Mellow Brick Road, which is also for that older audience. So that's my new bag, mm. helping Just the say the 50s. name of the podcast It's again. called Mellow Brick Road. It's yes. so cool. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> that's good. So, and that's really such an example of the marketing. Like It mm. just speaks to the audience. And well, hopefully. Yeah. yeah and what's we'll the see. book called? Uh, it's called The One Minute Commute. So the it's with um, Pam McMillan, and I believe it hits the shelves in July. Mm -hmm. And the book is about? Well, it's about starting, growing a very small business from, primarily from a home base, but mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be a home base, but it's, yeah, it's everything I've ever, ever learnt about um, starting and growing a, a very small business. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of people want to know how to do that. Yeah, well, look, I'd say it's um, having read your book recently. I think it's, it's the ideal partner book to Ooh, your book. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think yours is, is you know, very strong, in, particularly in the sort of financial side, as one would expect. Mm. Uh, but anyway, yeah. yeah. So we wish you well, Robert. So Thank you very as much. As we finish up here, mm. is there anything, because thinking about our audience, and, you know, this, this audience is... Um, an audience of people thinking about starting a business mm. and your audience is a similar group of people and you're niching into a particular age group. Mm. Anything, any parting words of wisdom from you? Uh, well, I think it's kind of really what we just spoke about, yeah. which is research. Um, and I would just say, you know, design it right. Um, you can obviously adjust and tweak and fiddle as you go, but I think the more work that anybody puts into the initial design of the business in the early days, um, the better. Mm. You know, so many businesses are, are somewhat, if not totally, accidental. Businesses that get started because somebody says, hey, can you do this? And then it's quite hard two years down the track to kind of retrofit, um, mm. you know, uh, mm. structure and systems and processes and things. So I say just do what you can to get it right mm. from the first stage. And always hold a vision of where you're going. And, uh, you know, I, I've still got my vision board back home, the one that I did in my shed in the garden in 1999 with pictures stuck all over it and I it's still it just I get breathless every time I look at it I think it's so weird because it's exactly the business I created. Mm, it is the uh, vision board stuff just mm, works doesn't it? It does yeah. Robert thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. And right now, you may feel inspired to create a vision board for yourself. What is that big vision of where you want to take your business? The thing about a vision board is that they really do work. You may also feel inspired to go and take a listen to Robert's podcast, Mellow Brick Road. It is a terrific podcast, and I am a guest in the episode released on the 1st of June called Making a Mark in the Inner City. And Robert asked some terrific questions, and I surprised myself with the answers. Anyway, you may also want to check out Robert's book, The One Minute Commute. Such a clever title, isn't it? As always, you'll find full transcripts of all the podcast interviews over on my website, healthynumbers.com.au, with links and show notes. And before you go, there's some gifts for you as you dream about building your business. Do you crave to have some actionable steps to help you get started? What to do next? Are you looking for someone who truly gets what it's like to actually start a business? Someone who knows what to do and when to help you get your business off the ground. Head on over to my website, healthynumbers.com.au, where there are so many resources waiting for you. I look forward to sharing with you some of the things I've learned from over 15 years of business experience working with hundreds of people just like you. You'll find my business checklist ready to download so you can avoid the common mistakes so many others make when starting a business. I use this same checklist with my clients and the feedback from them has been terrific. So I want to share that with you as well. What are you waiting for? Jump on my website, healthynumbers.com.au. Download that checklist and start building that business of your dreams today. As we always say, ideas without action, well, they're just that, ideas. What action are you inspired to take today? Till next time, thanks for listening.